welcome to the all new House of Closure podcast. I'm your host, AJ Guyton, and I'm here with a very, very special guest, uh, special to my heart, one of the one of the goats of Indiana basketball, in my opinion, if not the goat. We're here with Coach Steve Offer. How you doing, Coach? Very good. Thanks for having me on. Oh, no problem, man. I like that Nevada, that blue, that Wolfpack blue on you. Look good, yeah. man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, yeah, you're doing, you're doing good, man. Um, first thing I wanted to jump in, for me, I, I didn't know, I don't know the real in the, this, the real Steve Offer when it comes to your upbringing. Um, what, give me an idea of what it was like growing up in your household. Well, I was very fortunate first, AJ, very blessed that uh, had a, my parents are just terrific individuals, um, great role models, dad and mom, both mentors of mine, Coach Knight, obviously a mentor of mine, but being able to, I grew up in a coach's home. So he was a high school coach, first at Martinsville, well, actually at South Knox down in Southern Indiana is really where he got his start, Monroe City in South Knox. And they went to Martinsville where he coached Jerry Seastein, uh, who ended up having a terrific career and somebody that I really tried to model my game and, and how hard I needed to play because uh-huh. Jerry really played the game at the at the highest level as far as how hard he competed. Uh-huh. Um, and then Newcastle for most of his career, and that's where I really, from about fifth grade on, grew up. And, you know, getting a chance to play in the largest high school field house in the world. And back in the day then, it was one class, and, you know, I was – very fortunate that I grew up, in my opinion, in a in the Indiana high school one class deal because um, mm-hmm. kind of like college, you got 350 schools in the state of Indiana at the time competing for one title. Um, and we had the North Central Conference was just an amazing conference. Great athletes, great players. A lot of the North Central Conference ended up having a lot of guys go to Indiana. A lot of guys go to Purdue, Notre Dame. You know, it just so the competition that I had was incredible. But uh, just good Christian parents that uh, taught my brother and I the the ins and outs of everything and really gave us an incredible foundation of how we needed to end up building our careers, not just in basketball, but more importantly in life. Right. And which one of your uh, parents, part of your parents' personalities did you get? And the examples are, you know, you might got your competitiveness, competitiveness from your mom or your, 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 your attention to detail from your father. And they all mold together and they create, you know, a legend of Steve Offer. So which, what did you, uh, personality trait did you get from your parents? Yeah, you know, it's probably, uh, probably a combination of both because, mm-hmm. you know, you know, both of them, you know, are, are loving people. They're competitive people. They're caring people. Uh, my dad, obviously, being in sports and all of his life, uh, so obviously very competitive. My mom would tell you that when we were in Martinsville, I made it to the the nationals of the elk hoop shoot. And while while dad was coaching and doing his game, she's flying me around everywhere So right. mm-hmm. and driving me around. So I, I think mom would probably be the one to say she gets my – my free throw my I get my free throw ability from her I think that's right. what she'd probably say oh okay and um we we, we kind of are are up as I did my studying about you uh you know our our, our paths are kind of parallel what we how we became good basketball players you're a great basketball player you kept a basketball in your hand you shot all the time but I think about today's game and in and, and, and the, and the uh the training evolution that we're in right now, where the, every little seven year old has a trainer. Um, what what was the most, from your perspective, the most important time for skill development in a child? And yeah, that's a great, it's doing? a great question, AJ. And mm-hmm. and you know you're younger than I am, but you still are the, pretty much the same era where, mm-hmm. you know, we used to play outside. We used to play okay. in, in the park. You know, mm-hmm. and we have pickup games against. And I always thought that was crucial for my development. I, I would always try to play against older guys. And, mm-hmm. you know, there were guys either out of college or they're just working in the Newcastle area, the Anderson area, the Muncie area. And I'm just playing – I'm trying to play against the old Wiley vets that right. know all the tricks and yep. can get under my skin. And mm-hmm. uh, Because I think if you grow up and you're just playing the same age or like you're a junior or senior in high school, you're going to be playing against freshmen and sophomores – I always felt like I could dominate those guys and that never helped me and playing outdoors, playing, you know, you, you grow up in the Midwest and you play outdoors on asphalt and it's, it's a hundred degrees when you throw the humidity in there and you, and there's no shade, you know, those courts don't have trees. And so, you know, if you lose, 
you might sit out for 45 minutes and you're just right. sitting there like bacon. And so I think I learned at an early age um, how to win and right. you better win if you want to play. Cause I didn't like so much sitting on that asphalt watching the game. And so I, I think that, and then growing up in a coach's home where, you know, I, I was very fortunate. I always had keys to the gym. I always had access to a ball. And, yep. um, but I thought dad did a really good job of, kind of giving me the blueprint and then not putting pressure on me. It was like, you know, Hey, here's the blueprint. If you really want to be good, this is what you got to do. And I just learned probably after my freshman year, when I got humbled a little bit, Mm -hmm. I only averaged one point a game. I was very skinny and uh, didn't have much of a freshman year. And that got, that was a humbling experience. And then I started doing kind of the, the all American workout that my dad created and actually put on video. Mm -hmm. I started doing that and I did it every day. And so, today's kid, it's a little different. You know, I, I didn't grow up in the AAU world, so I didn't have, I didn't play any, I played like two AAU games that were just coming into play when I graduated. So mm-hmm. these kids grow up in a, and I say it all the time now in coaching, I, I'll, I'll say, Hey, we're not playing AAU guys. You don't get to play a 10 o'clock game, lose and know you play again at six. Right. <laughs> right. You exactly. know, that, that doesn't happen here. You know, right. we don't want to lose. So yeah, you got to exactly. learn how to compete and win every possession, every game. And so it's a little different. And then, mm-hmm. as you mentioned, I think in the last five years, it's, it has become a training deal. It's, yes. you know, everybody's getting their own little trainer and their own gym. And, yeah. you know, we didn't have that. We didn't have that back in the day. And I think there's some positives to it from mm-hmm. fundamentals and those type of things. But I do think what's missing AJ with these kids today are playing against much older guys that, mm-hmm don't take anything from you. Like they could be the dudes in the, in the city that right. you don't want to mess with. Right. <laughs> you don't want to have anything to do. It's like, mm-hmm. I, I don't want to make that guy mad because right. if I make that guy mad, he, he could put me into the chain fence and mm-hmm. that helped me, you know, that, and I think that's gone. I, I think that's gone. gone of the outdoor courts and uh, even the pickup games. You know, I can remember pickup games at Newcastle. Yeah. My dad allowed the older guys to come in and, yep that just helped. You know, I think that really helped me as I progressed. And then obviously going to Indiana, I think it helped me ended up playing as a freshman and not mm-hmm. waiting to my junior, senior year. I was a little bit more experienced than most freshmen. Yeah, Cause people don't understand what those older guys do is they beat you up. They grab you, they hold you, they force you to play at a speed and at a velocity that you yeah. normally wouldn't. So when you yeah. do play with your normal age group, you become, you start to stand out a little bit. But the one thing I did learn playing with the older guys is it taught me how to be a role player. Because yeah. when you play with older guys or you're on their team, they're not going to allow you to just jack up shots and mess That's up. Right. The they're going to say, you guard him, the worst guy on the team. You stand in the corner, we yeah. throw it to you, open, you shoot it. You don't, yeah. you pass it to me. So. I yeah. learned that, that that the teamwork and also playing outside, and I I, I want to know how you felt about this. Uh, all the falling down, like oh, yeah. every time there's a layup, somebody gets hit, it hit the ground immediately. Yeah. And yeah. when you think about the, our upbringing, hitting the ground on asphalt, on concrete was not an option, or you right. probably wasn't going to get up. So whenever we went to the basket, we stayed strong, try to be strong as we can. We never hit that pole or hit that ground and got scraped up. Right. So I agree with you totally. The little basic little things, you, you learn how to become a general manager. You yeah. had to pick a team. You had to learn how to piece your team together at a young age. And like you said, most importantly, when you lost, you were done for an hour. So yeah. the games or every possession, we went to seven back then. I don't know what you guys yeah. went to by yeah. ones. And every possession was crucial to – because if you lost, you was going to be over there baking at 100 degree weather mad waiting right. on the next game. So – I think and you're that, not getting picked up as a young right. guy. It's not like you know, the, the team that's got next is waiting to pick you up as you lose. Like nope. they do now, you know, it's like, no, there's like 30 other dudes. Over the there. other dudes, there's five, it's five other teams, man. Yeah. And you got to so shoot like, around, man. You, so. start, you, you almost hope there's not a lot of guys showing up that day. Right. Exactly. Uh, you look around, you see that other third team, like, damn, we got to win this game. So yeah. no, you're right. that, the, the, the wisdom I got out of it was great because they, you know, sometimes you, as a player, like I was a sophomore, or junior, and I might have been one of the better players at Newcastle, then I'd go play those other guys. They didn't care about any of that. They right. didn't matter to them. They looked at me like, dude, you can't guard me, and I'm going to lock you up. And Easy. that's how I learned. And right. I learned much more, I think, in those in that environment than I ever did playing with guys my own age. 
I'm like, I have a daughter that's playing right now. She's 14, pretty good. I got a chance for her. My her mother was a pro as well. I got excited when I saw that 50, 50 minute workout you talked about. Can you give a quick run through of what that 50 minute workout? Cause you say your dad told you to right. do this for two weeks straight. Right. If you want to be committed to the game, what was that workout about? What was it like? Yeah, that's dad taught me the first thing probably about uh, establishing habits. You yeah. know, we do something for like 14 straight days, mm -hmm. good or bad. It right. could be the bad too, but it usually becomes a habit. Uh, you know, if all you're going to do is watch TV for 14 days, you know, or play video games for 14 days, you're probably going to develop a habit. Exactly. So it can be good or bad. And I can remember coming into his office and sitting down in his office and said, look, I don't want to just be some ordinary guy that comes through here. I want to be the best. And I can remember him looking at me and say, hey, that's great. You've got a great foundation. You're going to be a pretty good player if you don't do anything else. Mm -hmm. But if you're telling me you want to be the best, you got to get more serious with your workouts. You got to get more serious with the fundamentals. I shot the ball on this side of my head. Right. Yeah. People kind of forget, but I was, I was scrawny. My driver's license was like five, 10 and a half buck 25. I mean, right. I had to do this just to get it up. And mm -hmm. I can remember him saying, if you don't get the ball to here, you're never going to be a very good shooter. And so he changed my shot. He changed my workout program and he just, the drills are simple. Mm -hmm. But he gave me 10 drills that I had to do every day. I had to get 100 free throws in every day. Mm -hmm. And so it's not surprising that, you know, all of a sudden, if you look just at my high school career statistically of what happened each of those four years, it didn't have any – I didn't get bigger or much stronger. I mean, I grew to six one, but I graduated high school at about 50. So it's <laughs> right. not like I was – I didn't walk onto the gym and – as, as scouts do today, I didn't pass any eye test. There was no eye test that I passed. Right. So I had to be the most skilled. I had to be the, the basketball IQ had to be at a high level. And I think that workout and AJ, I'd get it in at six in the morning. I, I had to mow lawns growing up. So maybe I did it at noon. Maybe I did it at 11 o'clock at night, but I made sure I got that thing. I didn't miss too many days in about a seven day, a seven year period doing that work. The, re the results showed that. Um, and I, it, your high school career was phenomenal, obviously, but I always ask guys, what was that moment, that game, or that moment where you was like, oh, shit, I'm different? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, was it a 50 point game? Was it a plan against another superstar? I can remember my moment. I want to know what your moment it was. Yeah, you know, I was fortunate. Once my sophomore year started, I started. You know, I started – the numbers started going up. My game started going up the time I got to be a junior. But I think it was probably my senior year when I played James Blackman on a Friday who was at Marion who ended up having a really good high school career at Marion and going to Kentucky. Yeah. And then played Scotty Hicks in Indianapolis Cathedral on a Saturday who ended up having a great career uh, himself, uh, both at Cathedral and at Notre Dame. And mm -hmm. we would end up competing against each other in college. We were on the same Indiana All-Star team. But playing Marion on a Friday in front of 10,000 at the field house and then playing Cathedral on a Saturday in front of another 10,000 and, and playing at a high level in those two games against two guys that I had an incredible amount of respect for, mm -hmm. I think just solidified that, like, okay, I'm just not a high school guy. Right, I think yeah. I can play at the next level. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we all, we all probably are more confident than what maybe we should be, but – you know, you still when you get a when you get an opportunity to play for Coach Knight, there's still going to be that. Can you play there? <laughs> exactly right. And, and I think that weekend just kind of solidified in my mind that if I keep working, I can play against athletes of this caliber. Because I thought Scott and James were as good as we had in our state at that time. And that James Blackman is that his son that went to Indiana? Yeah, all those sons. Yeah, he's okay. got a bunch of them. <laughs> okay. Yeah, he's got a James up. Jr. that went there. So yeah, okay. I told James, I said, well, at least your son got it right. <laughs> you didn't get it right, but at least your son right. got it right. Right. He, he can shoot that ball. Man. Yeah, good yeah, player. good player. Uh, so did you commit early to IU? Yeah, Stu Robinson, uh, who was a year ahead of me that played at Madison Heights with Ray Tolbert and, uh, and uh, Winston Morgan. Stu was a year ahead of me. I got to play three years with Stu. Hmm. Um, but we played Madison Heights at um, Newcastle my junior year, Stu's senior year. And Stu had already committed to Indiana. Hmm. And prior to my uh, junior year, coach had offered me a scholarship. And, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm so old school, AG. I didn't take one official visit. I, didn't Man, take, I was going to ask that. Too. You're, you're allowed five. <laughs> I didn't take one, including, 
Indiana, I, I never told coaches, but I'd always tell his assistants, um, Royce Waltman and Joby and all those guys, I'd say, you got me for cheap because I didn't, didn't do yeah, I didn't even come to an official visit to Indiana. And, you know, dad took me down there all the time to games and camps, but I didn't even, they didn't even spend money on an official visit for me. I, I committed so early. Right. And I was going to ask that, and did you, do you have any regrets about that? Not taking those, not, now that you're in, a head coach in the business and you see how they pamper them a little bit and make them feel good and, and maybe steer you in a different direction. Do you wish you would have took maybe one or two? No, no, because <laughs> I, I would have hated to uh, have done something else because, right, I, yeah, you that's know, right. Playing in that system and playing for coach, you know, I, I, coach is turning 80 tomorrow. And um, I, I, we just did the little birthday card wishes. And I put that in there. I can remember him coming into the home and doing a home visit and, mm -hmm. you know, him saying, Hey, I can, I can promise you four things. You're going to play with great teammates. You're going to mm -hmm. get a chance to play for championships. You're going to get your degree and you're going to have a friend for life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, not only did he do those four things, AJ, he did so many more than that, but right. to have a coach come and now I see it because I've been recruiting for 30 years and you recruit against other coaches, some ethical, some not ethical, right. but promises are made to these young men that they just don't happen. And being a friend for life, now that coach is getting ready to be 80 and I turn 56 next month, knowing that uh, that college coach I can still call up and get advice from and just mm -hmm. have a friend. That, that's something that is really meaningful. And I, and I couldn't have, you know, I look back, I'm so blessed, AJ. I don't know how I could have scripted right. my college career uh, mm -hmm. any better. And obviously coach had an uh, enormous amount to do with that. You know, back in the day, it was still amateurs that made the Olympic team and, I ended up having a, a, a fairly successful freshman year and I got invited to the Olympic trials. There was only 77 people and I was just excited to be invited. But now my college coach is the coach. Uh, at that time, a lot of the foreign competition were playing zones. Yeah. And I, I ended up making that <laughs> team just because I could shoot the ball and probably because I could help navigate for the other guys, the other Olympians of playing for coach Knight in a short yeah. amount of time. And, that would have never happened uh, to me being somewhere else. So I, I'm just very, very thankful that I got the opportunity to play for coach at Indiana. Uh, now, you could, like you said, you couldn't script it any better. I mean, you were the measuring stick, and you still are the measuring stick, and, and most are going well, to – It wasn't easy, and it wasn't, you know, when I got absolutely. there. Absolutely. I know that. <laughs> when, Todd, when Todd and Daryl and I came to Indiana, by the time we became seniors – we were on the brink of being coach's first recruiting class, not to win a big 10. And, you know, and that, and that was, that was really on our minds because we'd been a second twice. We'd been awfully close and we'd had some good years. We made it to a lead eight, you know, we'd done some good things, but you didn't want to be the first recruiting class, not to win a big 10. And it went down to the final game of the year. Mm. Purdue had to get blown out at Michigan and we had to beat Ohio state at home. And we ended up tying Purdue for get a and we got a co-championship and I really think AJ that ended up leading to really helping the the run for the national title because right. there was pressure taken off of Daryl Todd and I of I can remember I remember going out after that game beating Ohio State with those guys were like wow what well, just the the pressure that got off of us that now we had won a Big Ten title and I thought we played a lot looser than those six games that we had in the national tournament. And unfortunately, unfortunately for me, there always has to be a first. And I ended up being the first class, one of the first <laughs> classes that didn't win a Big Ten. I shouldn't title. have brought that up. I apologize. <laughs> no, no, it almost, I apologize. It's a, it's for me, tear. it went down to the last day. So hey, I mean, it, it, it almost happened. It's a tear former right here. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Because you know, honestly, I always look at that. And I'm like, damn, if we could have just won one. Things right. would have been a lot different than how yeah. it ended at Indiana. So yeah. we bear that kind of burden. And I don't, I don't, it, I don't lose sleep over right, it. But right. it's something when I see you, I see Isaiah, and I see I'm like, we dang, we but we gave it a uh, we yeah. and, I, and I want to kind of segue into that a little bit all, but when we during that time period, I know you probably were coaching, but you always have an eye on your alma mater. Oh, and yeah. we just couldn't. Click. We had we were losing McDonald's All Americans. We lost uh, Jason Collier, Neil Reed, Luke Record, and just a lot of things were happening from an outside perspective, from a former player perspective. What did you see that was different about that time period 
that, that those teams and those opportunities, we just couldn't get over the hump. And, and I think the game was starting to change a little bit. I know when you first started playing, uh, you, I think the three-point line was in 87. Right, or, my last year. Your last, last year. year. So it wasn't – but at this time, everybody was running to the line. So the right. defensive strategies now were different, but we were kind of still doing the same thing. From your perspective, what – what did you see different in those teams that were different than your Big Ten championship teams and, and uh, national championship teams? Yeah, and it wasn't just Indiana. I think just the mm-hmm. game started to evolve. When I was in my four years, we didn't have a three-point line. Yeah. If you can remember, if you can remember the year before the three-point line came in, the ACC, Sam Perkins was killing that. They had a three-point line in the ACC that was oh, okay. underneath the top of the key. It was like 17 feet. So <laughs> Sam Perkins was like killing that thing. So. But we had three shot clocks. When I got there as a freshman, we had no shot clock. Mm-hmm. Then there was a 45. Then there was a 40. Then it was a 35. Mm-hmm. So the rules kept changing for me. So the time you got there and others, everybody started figuring out the 19-9 three-point line and the 35-second shot clock. Those, those rules kind of changed the game, I think, from spacing, um, <laughs> coach being a motion team. You know, it, right. when I was there, it was like, you better make four passes. You better get two yeah. ball reversals. You better get that thing moving. And 30 seconds, you brought in the, you know, all the rules coming from the top. All of a sudden, yep. you're using pick and rolls. Like, yeah. my four years in college, I don't know if I had to defend two pick and rolls, and I don't know if I was ever in a pick and roll. <laughs> right. So, yeah. and now it's like it's a pick and roll. It's all different. Piece, you know, so I think rules start changing. And then the other thing that started happening, like you said, with Coach, Guys started leaving for the pros, and yeah. we didn't have any of that. We didn't right. have any of that thing growing up. You know, Keith Smart didn't leave early. You know, Dean Garrett didn't leave early. Daryl didn't leave early. I didn't. There was nobody in my four years that we even thought was going to leave early. So, I think those things changed because coach is such a culture guy. Coach is such a yep. build a program guy, and I think when those things start happening to a lot of programs, you end up getting a. Mm-hmm. You know, just the turnover of players affects guys that are really into developing a four-year culture and program. I think that affects a lot of programs. Great, great points. Um, halfway through, man, and I want to get to this, what I call Hoosier 10. It's just 10 questions that you'll be able to answer for, for the Hoosier Nation community. First question is, what dorm did you live in on campus? Beck. I Beck lived in Beck for a year. Right. For a year, and then uh, I moved off campus and spent my last three years in Jackson Heights Apartments. Okay, yeah. Uh, we, back then, they didn't know we were for not for but we were required to stay in a, a dorm for, our for freshman year. year as yeah, that's the way we were. Yeah, we and were, then yeah. when was the last time you were in Bloomington? Uh, this past summer, um, I took my dad down. I uh, came back in for the fourth. Normally, I have a basketball camp that now we're moving to. Huntington University, because my son, my oldest son, just got the head coaching job at Huntington University. So we're going to move that from central Indiana, where we've had it all these years, to now up to Huntington. But um, I came back, even though COVID canceled all the camps, I got to spend two weeks around the 4th of July. My dad's birthday is the 3rd of July. So we came back to do some family stuff. I took dad down to see coach um, right around the 4th of July. So okay. awesome. um, about, I, I get down, when I get down to see him or you know, there's a lot of guys still in that area. Todd lives up in northern Indiana. Joe Hillman's right there in uh, the Indy area. Brian Sloan as well. Jeff Olipin's still mm-hmm. in there. So I got a lot of teammates that are kind of still right there. So every now we get together. I got back for the, I think, the Players Alumni event uh, okay. two years ago. Not mm-hmm. last year, but two years ago. So I don't get there a lot just because I'm out west. He's working, but, yeah. um, and then when I go home, I usually see my brother uh, yeah. and his family. Or I'm seeing – Tanya's brother is still in Newcastle. So I use, it's usually Newcastle or the lake where my mom and dad live. Okay, great. Uh, what's the favorite place to eat when you go back? Yeah, that's a hard one. I don't make anybody mad. So uh, yeah. <laughs> that, that's, that's a hard one. But uh, like if I if I only would got back to, to Bloomington for like an hour or two, if, if, I, if that just gave me one thing, it's going to be a Nick Stromboli. Okay, if, I can get, if I can get the Stromboli <laughs> Nick, I'm pretty good. <laughs> awesome. What, what was your toughest matchup in college? Yeah, Gary Grant. Gary uh, Grant. You said Gary, that on the interview. <laughs> yeah, Gary Grant at Michigan. And uh, mm-hmm. I, when I got the UCLA job, I moved to Calabasas. Mm-hmm. And I hadn't seen Gary in years. Um, we disconnected just because he was in the NBA. I was coaching different spots, and we'd kind of gotten apart. But uh, I'm sitting at the Calabasas uh, uh, car wash. 
and there's a guy two chairs in front of me waiting and i got my oldest son Corey with me and i go Corey, that that that's gary that's grant him. i know that's <laughs> gary grant and but i couldn't see him uh yeah. he's bald now and yeah. you know we all get older and i i yeah. just i couldn't see him but i just when you know you when you played against somebody that just gave you fits and and you had to I studied film on him religiously and it took really to my senior year to where I had good games against him because he just he was one of those long athletic guys that mm-hmm. used his athleticism and and he had that mindset I'm yeah. stopping you and yeah, there are a lot exactly. of guys that might have that mindset but mm-hmm. through cutting through doing what I did they would eventually just fall off Gary was he was just one of those guys that it was all the time, but I, I finally had to wait till he spoke at that car wash. I said, I said, Corey, that's Gary Grant. And then we started talking and, uh, but by far, I, and I had a lot of guys that uh, were hard to compete against in the big 10, but Gary right. Grant was the, he was the toughest guy I had to go against. Absolutely. And it was there, it was the toughest place to play or in the big 10 on the road. Yeah, that's hard. Uh, again, the big 10's changed from yeah. when you and I were there, there were teams that, you know, don't make sense to me, but um, <laughs> right, right. I'm, I'm old school. But, right. uh, you know, when I played versus coaching changed it. Uh, um, but when I played, obviously, Purdue was a hard place to play. Yeah. Michigan was a hard place to play. Mm-hmm. And I thought Illinois was oh, a really hard was place because in, in my tenure at Indiana, my four years, the teams that were the best were Illinois, Michigan and and Purdue. Those were the three best year in year out and late in my career Iowa the new Carver Hawkeye that became a yeah that was always to play what it was but, about um, that gym. yeah but we <laughs> I always liked the older gyms I like Wisconsin's yeah. older gym yeah. I like St. John's Arena at Ohio State much better than the new one yeah. um mm-hmm. I love the barn up in Minnesota Absolutely. um you know that was fun too but Michigan Illinois Purdue night in night out those were the hardest road games we had to play in in, in succession with that question is there a place you never won on the road uh, I don't think we won. I don't think I won at Purdue, at Purdue four okay. years. I, I might. I don't know if we won at Purdue. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd have to look back. But yeah, we'll fact check that. We'll yeah, fact that that's that's the one that hits because I know I didn't have that. I think the only team that we didn't have a winning record against was Purdue because I don't think we beat them there and they beat us. Um, the game coach threw the chair. Yeah, yeah. Was oh, you was in that, that game? I was a part of that, and that was oh, Purdue, and we lost ooh. that home game. So, what was going through your uh, mind when you saw this dude throw this chair across the floor? <laughs> well, I, I didn't know at the t- I didn't know at the time, but it was because of me. There was a loose ball, <laughs> and I got a loose ball, and he thought Purdue fouled uh, me, mm-hmm. and they either called a jump ball or they called a foul on me, and that's kind of what. There was a lot. We weren't we weren't playing very well that year, so there was a lot boiling up in coach. And I think that's probably he says there was some old lady he was throwing. Yeah, right, it he in my stuff. mind, it was my fault. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> it was my, so I'm just standing you. at the timeline. That you know how that is, AJ. I'm just standing at the timeline, and then when he gets kicked out, I'm like, oh yeah. At some point, I gotta go back in that locker room. So absolutely, he probably throwing it at you. I'm just but, worried uh, about that. But, so is that your most memorable Bob Knight moment? No, I think it's probably most memorable maybe for the fans because there was 17,000 people in there and they got to right. see that. But as you know, the practices were – the practice was the one that I had looked back and we talk about as former players now mm-hmm. the most because Coach just had that ability to – you just couldn't take a day off. Nah. And, <laughs> and that's what I appreciate. You may not do it – you may not appreciate when you're playing for him, but now coaching for 30 years and seeing how he made me a better player, mm-hmm. he just never – he never took the, you know, it, it was on the gas pedal all the time. I can remember having games where I, I dropped 30 on somebody and the next day it was like <laughs> I got two buckets, exactly. you know, and, and then I had a bad game and it was the same. The, the thing I appreciate about Coach, he was so consistent. It yep. wasn't, you didn't all of a sudden show up and he was very funny. You know, right. people yeah, was very the, the humor side in Coach. Now, when it's on you, you're probably not laughing, but the rest yeah, of the team exactly. is, and we know it's going to rotate. But um, I, I love his competitiveness. I love his consistency. And he made you even – I always say this. Even when you didn't want to be better, he made you better. And yeah. that is an incredible trait for a coach. But the practices were probably – but as you know, we had some wild plane rides. We had some yeah. wild bus rides. You know, if I had a most, <laughs> if I had a most memorable thing, you know, we got that – that. Uh, 
that airport on the side of town there where we'd always fly out of. And, and I had made the mistake of, uh, posing for a calendar for, uh, a sorority for a charitable girls organization. I thought I was doing a, I thought I was doing a good Noble, thing and ended thing. Up in an yeah. violation. So I got suspended for the Kentucky game. And mm-hmm. I asked Dan Dockage, I said, am I supposed to go on a trip? And Dan's like, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you, but <laughs> you probably need to be on the bus. Right. Uh, Cause if you're not on the bus to the airport, then it could be. So I, you know, I listened to Dan, I get on the bus and you know how coach coach got some superstitions to him. And as you know, when, he, yep. when you get off the bus, he hits you on the back. You know, he just kind of hits you on the back as you go off the bus because he's the last one to get off the bus. And I'll never forget. I get that pat on the back and then I get the, <laughs> the, right. the coat. And he's like, what are you doing on this bus? You're not going. And I'm like, okay, coach, I just didn't know. And he goes, find your own way back. Right. Wow. <laughs> so now I'm like, okay, I'm supposed to walk back from that airport. That's like right. <laughs> minutes, 20 minutes away if you're in a car. Right. And I'll never forget our bus driver. The I see the I see the plane go through the clouds on the way to Lexington, and I'm walking up this road, and the bus driver pulls up next to me and just opens up the door and goes, oh. "Hey, you need a ride?" <laughs> I said, "Yeah, it's freezing. I need a ride." So there's a lot of memories that uh, of that you have that uh, <laughs> kind of shape you and mold you as you get older, and I've always appreciated. It. Although I didn't appreciate it at the time, I've always appreciated how honest, right. fair, and consistent coach was. Hey, and we just got a fact check. You did win at Purdue your freshman year. Okay, so yeah, I might have. <laughs> you know, all that tells me is I lost two home games in. I don't know <laughs> right. that. But uh, <laughs> if we did do that, then I, I think I probably uh, – Illinois was a tough one. Illinois was loaded too. But um, I, I can't remember. I, I just can't remember if we won on every everybody's floor. That's a hard one to know. Right. Okay, the last three, three questions from Who's a 10 was first, there's a Mount Rushmore of IU basketball players. You're on it, so you got three spots to fill. Who are the other three spots? Wow, yeah, that's and that's so it, hard, AJ. Because you it won't just, hurt nobody feeling. You know, I just I just here. played. I just was down <laughs> in the Southern Indiana. I came home about two months ago and played in the Southern Indiana Hall of Fame golf outing that my dad puts together. And I invited Calbert. Uh, Calbert got a, I got a chance to play with him. He drove up. He was so kind. He drove up from. Uh, uh, from Atlanta, but you know, you, Calvert's got to be one of those guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I really respect what he did, and mm-hmm. you know, you look at those those teams in the seventies and eighties. Isaiah, yeah. you know, Isaiah, although he was only there two years, it is what uh, it there is. Many guys <laughs> that did any more in two years than what Isaiah, and then the seventy six team, you can almost but all you three guys, three did. guys. You know, <laughs> Scott May was mm-hmm. Scott May was just a special, special guy, and how he. And I, I can remember watching that 76 team, you know, mm-hmm. and, and I learned a lot from that 76 team. And, and you know, there's there's so much history at Indiana and there's so many great players that, you know, everybody mm-hmm. made – as I was making, Calvert would end up passing me and I'm, yeah. I end up passing uh, Don Slunt, you know. And I, I never had a chance to see him play, but phenomenal player. You know, and Walt Bellamy's and it's just – you know, George was there for a year or two. Yeah. You know, and and, and, and Big awesome. Mac's a – a guy I've admired for so long. So there's just so many great ones that that's, that's a hard one. I, I'm honored that I'm even in the discussion of those type of things, because these are guys that those guys on that 70 team, I grew up admiring and watching and trying to mimic and just hoping that I get an opportunity one day to be a part of those guys and part of playing for Indiana and playing for coach. So very fortunate that I'm a, a, in a in a university that's got a lot of dudes that uh, were great players. You on top of that list, man. And uh, so your f- favorite is always different than greatest. Who was your favorite IU player to watch? Uh, the 81 team, I got a chance because I was a 83 high school grad. Okay. So, mm-hmm. you know, I was in uh, – so I watched the 81 team a lot, you know, watching Randy Whitman. I, I didn't know, A.J., at the time I was going to be a guy that – you know, ended up going from a point guard in high school to really being an off guard in Coach Knight's system where I'm, I I didn't have to read screens in high school. Right, I had the yeah. ball in my hands. So mm-hmm. I created things. Um, so it was a different mindset. So we, when I was watching Indiana, Randy, I can remember him, how good he was yeah. at off ball stuff. And so not so much in 81, but when I got to college, I started watching a lot of tape on him of how he moved without the ball. And that helped me watching him. But you know, watching Isaiah and then watching those 70 teams of 
Laskowski and, you know, you know, Wilkerson and Buckner and, and May and Kent Benson and Steve Green. These were all guys that I watched. And, you know, it wasn't so much trying to mimic them because and I wasn't going to look like any of them. Right. <laughs> I, mean, I was, you know, Buckner was a huge point guard uh, right. in the in the seventies, and Wilkerson. I was never going to be that long and athletic, but just admiring how consistent they were, Abernathy, all those guys, how consistent they were with winning. I enjoyed watching those guys, and I think that's how I started buying into the Indiana thing. Was that it, it's cool if you win, <laughs> you know? It goes all the way back to the asphalt games. It's not fun to lose. And those right. guys taught me a lot about the consistency and what went into winning. Right. And uh, you, to me, in my, life, my last question for the Hoosier team. But I, I will say this. I'm sorry, AJ. You but if I had a favorite player, favorite. it's Keith Smart. Keith Smart. That dude, hey, that dude did a big hey, shot. So, for the reasons we talked about. Yeah, hey. so if, if, you only, if you only gave me one pick and I had to choose one, it'd be my boy Keith. He, he got to be there. He definitely yep. has to be there. So go on. We're going to move into your, your Indiana career and talk a little bit about – let me ask you this question. This is from me. We, we talk about motion offense. I remember Coach Knight used to always institute this rule for me that I, could never, I couldn't dribble the ball more than two times. Did he do that to you as well? Yeah, but unlike you, AJ, you, unlike you, AJ, you could guard. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I couldn't – as Coach would – he had a lot of, uh, lot of sayings on what I couldn't guard, and I put right. something <laughs> I can't do a podcast for him, but uh, right for sure. <laughs> so most of what he did to me, uh, I can remember one thing that he did. Uh, you know, you were either red or white, right? And, yep. and I was usually always on red. And one day he came to practice, and he said, "He said, Alfred, until you learn to defend, you're on white." Right. So he made me turn the jersey to white. white. Yeah. But and it as a scoring mindset, and I was the wrong mindset. Yeah. I should have went to white, and I should have guarded red at a higher level exactly. but my mind was I'm killing the red you know, my <laughs> mind is oh you think these guys can guard i'm gonna kill these guys and i can remember that practice <laughs> that practice i just busted everybody they, yeah. uh, they didn't guard me and so i go off the court i go off the court that day going okay coach let, let's see what you do tomorrow because i just showed you those guys can't guard mm -hmm. so the next day of practice he says Offered, you're you're on white, and he gives the team on white, and he goes, "Hey, white, everybody can shoot today except Offered." <laughs> and I was like, "Oh, I was like, he got me." Yeah, he got him. He got me because now it's like this is miserable. Now I, I got to play all this. I got to play motion offense, and I got to uh -huh. play man to man defense, and I don't get to shoot it. This is like the worst practice ever. <laughs> so he didn't really put a dribble limit on me, but that's how he tried to he tried to mess with me. From right. that standpoint. That's hilarious, man. And, and on to your championship team, man. I talked to AJ Moyer, and we always talked, he talked about a, a turning point in the season or a turning point for them where they realized that they were uh, a championship contender. What, what in, in that 87 season, what was those turning points for you guys? Yeah, I think we, we had really had a very good year. We'd only lost to Vanderbilt at home or Vanderbilt on the road in the non conference. And then in the, in the Big Ten season, we only lost three games, but we lost two games in a row. We lost, um, we lost at Purdue, and then we lost at uh, Illinois. Mm -hmm. So we lost back-to-back -back games when we had a two-game lead in the Big Ten, and we were getting late in the year. And those two games late in the year, I think we knew we were pretty good, but mm -hmm. then we lost those two games, and it was like a, a hit in the face because, again, we had to now go to the last game of the year. Mm -hmm. And you know how it is. It's matchups and it's seeding when you talk about advancing. If we don't win the Big Ten that year, Purdue probably gets the number one seed mm -hmm. and they play in Indy and they go to Cincinnati. Right. But because we won the Big Ten or at least tied the Big Ten with them, had a we had a higher ranking at the time, we get the number one seed. And so our path was Indy, Cincinnati, New Orleans. Um, but I think the turning point was winning the Big Ten, okay. winning that senior night game. And knowing that we just had a great regular season, but we capped it off with something, you know, just just having a good year. I don't know if we have a lot of momentum going into right. the tournament, but knowing we came off winning the championship helped us going into the NCAA tournament. So I don't know if it's a turning point or just a, a point that solidified, hey, we can do this. Right. And okay. I think that helped us. And that game was back and forth. I mean, you were playing yeah. against three well, NBA. Hobson was a big time. Yeah, Dennis Hobson was a big time player. So the, yeah. yeah, the Ohio State game it went down the last four minutes. So it was uh, 
it was a big time game. Absolutely. You head on to the championship game where you face Syracuse. They had three NBA players, Sherman Douglas, Tony Sankey, wow. Derek Coleman. What when Thompson. you walked on that floor and you saw those dudes, what, what's your mindset? What's, it's like, what's your mindset in championship game? Well, I think it helped playing UNLV in the semis because wow. that game more than any of them, and they might have had five NBA guys on that team. I think that game more than any of them, I can remember running out of the Superdome because it's so big. You're looking at one of the biggest arenas in the time, and there's 60-some thousand there. It was massive. And mm -hmm. we took the floor, and UNLV, when they took the floor, kind of ran right through us. And you're looking at those guys you're going, wow. <laughs> right. I mean, we're talking about huge and long and athletic, and they just – they took the floor. They had a swag just in warm-ups to them, and they hadn't been beat very much, and they just beaten Iowa, who we had a lot of respect for of how good Iowa was, and Iowa had them down 20 mm -hmm. and lost in the second half uh, in their Elite Eight game. So I think it helped us play in UNLV because um, Syracuse got Providence in the semifinal game that looked, more, I think, more like a college team. UNLV yeah. and Syracuse looked like NBA teams. And right. Um, both those games were great games. You know, UNLV plays at a whole much, a whole higher level uh, pace, and that was an up and down game where Syracuse yeah. was more of a possession by possession game. But both Syracuse and UNLV had special athletes. Absolutely, the three moments I remember the most is your three at the end of the half. I remember DC's two hand block. I don't know if you were. Did you were you up close and personal on that play? He rotated over. And he went up and he grabbed the ball out the air. I thought he rebounded it. And yeah. it was a block. And then Keith Smart shot, obviously, was the play of the game. Yeah. Walk us through that possession. With Keith, the I don't know if it was a timeout prior to that. There was a play that Coach ran. Did Coach run a play for you guys? Because I saw you coming off that low baseline curl looking mm -hmm. for the ball. And I think Keith just said, you know what? It's time to go. He went, got it back. What was going through your mind as you're watching that ball in the air? Well, I was hoping it goes in. That, that's for sure. Because you know, I was on the weak side, and, <laughs> yep. and if it doesn't go in, the odds are I'm not getting the weak side rebound. But <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> so I just wanted to go in. But you know, we needed Derek Coleman to miss free throw. Absolutely, uh, he did. and that helped. Uh, and then you know, it's a good teaching point now that I'm in coaching. <laughs> Those are rebounds you have to get. A lot of teams don't do a good job of rebounding missed free throws, that's and fair. we don't rebound that because they'd already had. I think Coleman got 19 rebounds. I think Cycli had double-digit rebounds, so just getting that missed free throw rebound was going to be huge. But the timeout prior to the to the free throw being shot, I think Coach just had so much confidence in us. Mm -hmm. um, I think he had more confidence in us of getting scores than he did stops. That's right, just the makeup yeah. of our team. Mm -hmm. But he had very good confidence. It, there was never a discussion on you got to get Steve open, right, Steve, you got to yeah. take the shot. There was never none of that. It was let's do what we do. And let's get the best shot available. And I think that confidence in us just it, it helped us going into that last play. And it and it we talk about it now as former players on that team that you know I'd had a last second shot against Michigan that year. Uh Joe Hillman had he had missed a shot in the corner that Dean Garrett tipped in uh at Wisconsin in a triple overtime game. So Dean had a um a last second shot. Daryl had shot an air ball from 12 feet straight on that Ricky Calloway catches and beats LSU on. So the one guy that hadn't been involved in it had been Keith. And so it's, you know, but Daryl makes an amazing play. Most bigs would have forced that. Forced that up. And doesn't mean he wouldn't have made it, but mm -hmm. you're probably not getting a foul call uh, in the last play of the game. Uh, he makes a great post feed kick out. And then obviously Keith makes a, and if you look at the clips of that, you know, that's not an easy shot that keeps not, like, he's not. almost behind the backboard when he yeah. shoots that thing. So, uh, obviously, one of the biggest shots in IU history. Yeah, definitely. And how did you celebrate afterward? Uh, did you do you remember vivid the celebration? How did you guys celebrate? Yo, know, Bob Neely. Uh, unfortunately, he's passed, but he was a police officer that had come to a lot of uh, practices, and a lot of us had got to know Bob really well, and. Uh, I, I got introduced to Bob that uh, I was on my way to see Tanya after getting back from the Olympics and he pulled me over for speeding. <laughs> so, uh, but it helps when you win an Olympic gold medal Absolutely. like three weeks prior because he just gave me a warning. Uh, but it kicked off a lifetime friendship and Bob was there. And I can remember Keith and I, when um, we finally got back to the hotel, there was unusual weather in New Orleans. It was very, very cold. 
but we wanted to go to Bourbon Street. We wanted to walk down and oh, yeah. and just we just won a national title, and so we wanted to get down there and see it. But I can remember we walked down there, and it was so brutally cold. There were fans everywhere. It was obviously a great party, but we weren't dressed for it. We just didn't have the clothing, so we didn't stay down there long, and we just came back to the hotel. But uh, it was just great, as you know, being a part of a team and the teammate, the teammates just being together, you know, and, right. and finally – you know, because when you play for coach, yep. even if you went on the road, he's finding something on that road trip back that's yeah. got to make you better. Absolutely. Or if you lose on the road, yeah. you just hope to – you hoping the plane lands. You hope the plane lands. <laughs> so it was good having a flight from New Orleans to yeah, Bloomington, right. and it was the best flight we'd ever had in four years. And then when you land at that airport that we talked about earlier, and you got people – you couldn't do that today, but you got people lined – they're out on the runway and they're lined of people just waiting on the plane to land. That, that was, and then we get back to assembly hall and it's packed. You know, those are things I'm going to remember the most about the celebration. Right. What, what did coach and I say to you after you guys won the championship? Yeah, I think he's sitting weird. I got a chance to sit with him on, uh, on the bench, you know, he grabbed me and um, you know, I think that just having him, kind of put his arm around me just saying his appreciation, yeah. um, you know, of, of the four years and those, you know, the, the, that's what you always want to hear. Want to hear. Um, so. And obviously from coach, you're not going to hear that every day because mm -hmm. he's got to be that tough, that tough guy that pushes you to greatness. And mm -hmm. I can remember, you know, just telling him at that point, you know, hey, thanks for never, you know, taking your thumb off of me. Thanks for making me a better player each and every year. And so it was, it was more just an appreciation when the game was over and we're waiting on the stage and everything to be put up. That was a pretty cool moment. Right. And you, you and, and going into the last part of your coaching, you got into coaching at a relatively young age. And uh, yeah. you've been coaching ever since. You've been great stops in Missouri State, Iowa, New Mexico, UCLA, and now Nevada. I, I remember vividly, um, you know, playing against you. You guys coming to Assembly Hall. That was, uh, was your first time. I don't know if it was your first time coming to Assembly Three Hall State. as a yeah, coach. Yeah, State. And uh, what was that feeling like to walk in that gym and uh, and, and to, to coach against your mentor and a guy you looked up for so long, knowing that you're yeah. trying to kick his butt and knowing it's going to be a problem if you Yeah, it's going to be a big – you know, it's a big problem. <laughs> and uh, right. I think that the first time I got in there was the – one of the Hoosier classics. Okay. And, and coach was so kind to, uh, mm -hmm. you know, because allow my Missouri State team to, you know, come come into Assembly Hall and experience all that. And, you know, so that was that was great. Um, unfortunately, the way the media is at times, yeah. it, it, because I was, uh, I was a former national champ and all this kind of stuff, they made it out like I'm the next coach at IU. And yeah, yep. that's what made it frustrating. If it was just going home to Assembly Hall, if it was just going home to Indiana, I would later have to do that several times at Iowa. That's never fun. You know, mm -hmm. I never I don't think I really enjoyed any of those trips other than Missouri State. Um, I didn't really enjoy any of those trips just because the media made this out like that. And it was so unfortunate because coach and I have a great relationship. I can remember calling him several times like coach <laughs> you're indiana i don't know indiana without coach knight right absolutely uh, i mean yeah. i i would not have i could promise you if, if coach knight wasn't a coach there i can't tell you i, I would have taken five official visits i would have <laughs> right other options i you know i when i thought of indiana i thought of coach knight i right. still do i still do aj to this day absolutely and that's not disrespect of any other coach that's not disrespect of indiana it's just really my ultimate respective coach. And I think that's what tarnished every trip I came back was the media wanted to make it act like I'm the next guy that's going to be in there. And, you know, what have there been, like four or five other guys now? They're going on. So, obviously, they were wrong. Yeah. And I remember in that game, he, you know, because I was waiting on him to come out the tunnel because I had a question way. about a matchup, and he yeah. snuck up behind you. And uh, did you see him coming? You were playing guard. No, I didn't. Yeah, yeah I, what I did didn't he say? see yeah, I didn't see any of that. And again, that's just, again, people don't see that, but that's mm -hmm. how coach is and yep. the kindness of coach because leading up to that game, the media was making a big deal out of the handshake. Yeah, uh, exactly. They had already pitted us against each other. And last guy I ever want to be pitted against is Coach Knight. Not, not just in coaching, but mm -hmm. period. Uh, he's a mentor of mine. And so they made a big deal out of it. And I, it might be the only time he's ever come out a different door. And mm -hmm. as you know, he's it was. 
he's got some superstitions to him, whether he wants to admit it or not, you mm-hmm. know, and you know, he, he eats that little bowl of ice cream at pregame meal for a reason every time. I mean, it's not just right. he likes ice cream. So there's mm-hmm. some superstitions there and for him to do that um, and take that pressure off of that. Cause mm-hmm. obviously I still, even though I was coaching, I was still thinking I'm, I'm coach Knight's player. So right. you got that nervousness to you anyway. Absolutely. You know? And so that kind of lightened the load a little bit uh, from that standpoint. So I appreciate him doing that. I remember the media tried to make it seem, uh, I don't know if they tried to make it seem or was some truth to it. And as players, we wonder, was there like an, an, an off period to you guys' relationship? Was he upset with you about anything? Or, or you know, you don't have to elaborate on what he was upset about it, but was he? Because uh, it seems like there was a time he was upset with this guy, that guy, this guy, and for whatever reason. But, you know, we never yeah, knew. I don't, was really I don't think it was ever so much at me as mm-hmm. much as it was – when he when he came under some fire mm-hmm. um, at Indiana, um, unjustly in my opinion, wholeheartedly. But when he started to come under fire, um, they immediately started. The media started saying, "I'm the next guy." Okay. And so now that just made some yeah, that, that made them for very awkward meetings when Absolutely. we were at Big Ten meetings or Big Ten mm-hmm. media days and that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. It made it very very awkward. So it wasn't so much of. I don't, I don't think he had a, a disgust of me. I never had anything but love and honor for him. Uh, but it, it made it hard for me because yeah. those were questions that I had to deal with when I was at Iowa. And it just seemed like it never went away. And all I'm trying to do is I want to reach out to coach and, and just show my support of him because I thought it was really unfair what he went through in the, the latter days of, of his career there because there's, there has never been and there never will be anybody that impacts a university and a game, in my opinion, more than what he did. He impacted not just university in the in huge ways, the money that was raised there, uh, the impact that he had at that school. And then what he did for high school basketball in that state, um, yeah. it just goes without saying. So I wish the ending would have been a lot more professional and a lot more um, of understanding what this man had, had given to that university and it, it didn't happen. And for whatever reason, I got drugged into it. And so it right. made some things some awkward and some, un, you know, some, some experiences that way. But uh, he's always been AJ, no matter what stop I've had, he's one of the first guys, my dad's one of them and he's another one. Anytime there's an issue, you know, I call him, he calls me and he's been there for me. You know, I, I got fired at UCLA January 1st, really January 1st, he's first phone call. Oh, really? He, you know, I mean, he, and that he don't call he even make yeah, a lot of phone calls Never. and so that that meant a great deal to me just to hear his voice on a day where i had been let go yeah you you've been successful everywhere you've gone a lot of iu guys that play for coach knight managers and all of that have been successful do you still yeah. use some of his philosophies in your coaching style today? oh yeah definitely you know it, i try to learn so much from him on how to break down film how right. to prepare teams uh obviously scouting ports as you know playing for him i always I can remember calling my dad up the first game I had against Illinois State, telling dad, dad, we know their stuff better than they do. <laughs> They're not going to score. <laughs> you know, and I, I think dad said, well, unless you're guarding that guy. <laughs> right, <yes. laughs> so, so my guy might have scored. But, right. I mean, coach was just so prepared. And mm-hmm. I can remember that being the thing I appreciate the most and stuff that I try to do. And then just being, being honest and truthful for guys. A lot of guys, even this era, they don't, they don't want to hear the truth. They all want to get to the next level, but they don't want to understand how hard that is to get to the next level. They want you to waste some wand, and it just doesn't work that way. So, yeah. you know, trying to be honest, trying to be uh, a program of great culture, and uh, and then I, I think really in recruiting, trying to recruit really good teammates so that every one of our players have great teammates to play for because Coach made that a point in his home visit with me, and I don't think I ever really thought about that until that comment. Right. and. Mm-hmm. Man, in my four years at Indiana, I played with great teammate after great That's teammate, cool. and that Good made people. it a lot of fun. Good people. And you, you've you been coaching a long time. What What's different? Like, uh, how has it changed, uh, the, the, the approach to coaching now? And I'm saying that in a sense, do, do you think Coach Knight would have been able to adjust to the way coaching is today? Yeah, I don't know if I'm going to go there, but, uh, you know, just the social media, yeah. is, uh, you know, people got a phone on all the time. So yeah. sometimes you got coaching moments that just you need to be who you are and coach. And because 
he knows what button to push with you. He knows what button to push. For me. It may not be politically correct, mm -hmm. but that's what's going to make you better. That's what's going to make me better. And now you're in a world where, you know, coach always had, you know, coach had a lot of sayings about how many opinions there are in the world. Right, yeah. And, yep. uh, heard that. He, he's always said everybody's got them. And uh, well, now everybody gets to be heard because Absolutely. of Instagram, Twitter, all the social media outlets. And, you know, that's what I think is unfortunate, you know, not just in college basketball, but what we're enduring as a country. There's just so much hate. There's, right. um, there's, forget the violence, forget all the stuff that's bad anyway, but it all starts because there's just so much hate. And right. mm -hmm. I think you see that it filters down into everything, whether it's mm -hmm. college basketball or businesses, or um, it's just very unfortunate, but I think social media technology has changed a lot of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so the thing we try to do with our players, AJ, is that I just feel like the phone is, that's where they get all their information. Mm -hmm. And I don't want the phone just to be where they get the information because mm -hmm. I know I can get on that phone and get on one outlet and Hey, this is the way our country is. And then I get on another outlet. No, oh, this is how our country is. Different, it's like, yeah, so you just get miscommunication after yeah. miscommunication. And you know what, if you just love each other and, and be kind and considerate, uh, things work out a lot better. And I want our players to know that, you know, you can always come to our coaching staff and talk about anything. I don't care right. what that is, whether it's social injustice, you got racial issues, you got family issues. And, you know, I think that's that's the hardest part for these young people is just they are communicated so differently in so many different avenues. And that gets to be hard to figure out what the truth is. So if we can be truthful in our coaching with them, I think that helps them, not just here, but when they leave here. I'm sure you had a lot of players that were affected by, you know, the George Floyd and activism and the protests. What kind, what, what adjustments did you have to make as a coach and maybe allowing more of your players to speak out or what, what things have you and your staff come up with to help these students get through this right. uh, trying times? Right. And, and the most difficult time, AJ, cause we're in COVID, you know, yep. so when, 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 when everything was hitting, yeah. We weren't even – we had just gotten players back to campus and they're going through quarantines uh, 14 days, so you can't be with them. So, you know, you're trying to communicate with them like you and I over a Zoom. Yeah, that exactly. never is, That's it's never as meaningful as just face-to-face. -face. So what we've tried to do, and we've had some setbacks because of COVID, but we've tried to bring in – we've got a great fellowship of Christian athletes organization here, and we got some really good people in the community um, you know, that have come in, and we try every Monday – to just bring them in to talk to our guys. Yeah. And it's been good because you, you want interaction. You want, cause we we're like everybody else. You got players of all color, all, all race, all ethnic backgrounds, all different cultures, neighborhoods all across the country. So sometimes players like, Oh, I know what that is. No, yeah. no you don't. Right. <laughs> no, yeah. you don't. And so right. I think getting them to interact and getting them to talk about things is really <laughs> healthy. And so that's really helped us here throughout the summer of just bringing those people in. Other than a coach, I think it's good having somebody on the outside come in to generate that discussion. And then coaches can start talking as well. And so that's been really, really good. We just – I wish it was more consistent. But because of some COVID setbacks and quarantines, we haven't been able to, as consistent. But I think our guys are – they understand kind of, you know, what's going on and how we can help them in any way. And we want to be supportive in every way we can. Absolutely. And then with COVID and, and, and protests and social injustice, did it bring you guys closer together? Yeah, I hope so. This team's very young. We have no seniors. Um, mm -hmm. We basically lost four starters and about 90 percent of our scoring. So it's a very young team. We got a lot of new players. So uh, we're still doing a lot of trying to bring them together. And unfortunately, COVID doesn't allow you to do you know, you can't do a lot of team functions, you know, other than really the court. You're not really allowed to do, at least here in Nevada, go out and have a lot of team functions that are happening. So we don't get to do a lot of the things like last year we had a player's retreat and it's really two days of bonding. We can't do that now. So you're just doing a lot of it in-house and at practice and at weights, but you're just trying to open the communication as much as you can. And, you know, fortunately things are progressing well and hopefully we're going to be playing some games. Obviously, as a yeah. as a player, that's what they want. Absolutely. Well, um, it, hey, man, this has been a fabulous uh, interview, man. I've learned so much. I do have two last questions. One, did, it, did Michael Jordan ever pay you that $100 he owed you? Because you made it. 
Yeah, <laughs> no, I did. And I earned that hundred dollars, but uh, no, he hasn't done that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I have some fun with him and uh, along the lines I've kind of, I've kind of told him he didn't have to do that anymore. You know, I, I know things have been tough on him and trying to, <laughs> Trying to find a hundred dollars in like a shoestring of one of his right. shoes might be hard, but uh, you know, finish it, opening your hospitals up and you can get yeah, to me. Yeah, it to me. So it's it's been fun that way, but uh, what was you know, that? I never got that back. Man, that was that's crazy. And, and within this question, why didn't Charles Barkley make the team? Well, that's a good question. A lot of people don't know that. I've told this to a lot of people, but Charles and I were roommates uh, mm -hmm. when it was '77. Uh, and then we started making cuts. So he get, he made it, uh, I think it was 32 at the time. So we were roommates when they moved us into the union. And because I think they did it alphabetically. So Alfred and Barkley, we were, we ended up being roommates. And he came in finally after one day, he goes, Steve, I'm, I'm getting out. I'm done. I go, what do you mean you're getting out? You're done. Because in my mind, he's making the team, you know, and he was by far one of the better players on in that group. But uh you know, I think he was talking to an agent. He was coming out of Auburn and he was getting advice. It ends up working for him. I didn't understand at the time, but he was getting right. advice that if he stayed on the Olympic team through August, he would miss out on some endorsement possibilities because Jordan was coming out. Ewing was coming out. Mm -hmm. Mullen was coming out. So a lot of these guys are going to be coming out. And so he opted. He actually, he actually cut himself. You know, right. he wasn't any coach didn't cut him. Uh, he went and said nothing against the coach, but I'm just being advised. And it worked out. You know, he got the right guard commercial mm -hmm. that he had for years. Oh, he so he it ended up, and then in '92 we lost uh, the Olympics lost in '88. Mm -hmm. So in '92 the dream team came up, and he ends yeah, up he getting the Olympic dream. gold medal anyway. So I don't know if he knew all that was going to happen, but uh, Charles just he's a he was a great dude. He was fun. He was uh, the personality you see on TNT. That's what he had back in the day. He just. Uh, He's just full of laugh and joy, and you never know what he's going to say. Yeah. But uh, you know, he's he's a fun guy. Yeah, I've been around you guys, you guys from that era, the eighties and late seventies, eighties and nineties, and that, those are the, the the most impressionable, most fun uh, former players that you can be around. The birds and the magics, and these guys. Pers yeah. Jordan, these personalities are genuine. You know, there's a little bit of arrogancy going on today, yeah. but yeah. back then, you guys are awesome to talk to. And, and, and I just, I, that's why I enjoy talking to you guys. But the final thing, man, I tell people all the time, you know, I played in Indiana four years. Coach Knight got the best out of me. Um, I didn't get a chance, like Tom talked about earlier, I didn't get a chance to win a championship, but we competed hard. I think we, we, we suffered a lot of issues internally. Neil Reed, Jason right. Carter, Luke Recker, and new assistants. And people don't understand the toll that takes. And then when we right. finally have a good year, we go into – the tournament and then the allegations from my freshman year surface. But I remember 2013 or 12, I got a, I tried to call coaches. I wanted a coaching job in Springfield that I wanted to go after. And he made the call for me. And he answered the phone. I said, hey, coach, hey, what's up, man? How you doing? He said, hey, you know, he always say, hey, AJ, what can I do for you? And he's like, I said, well, I'm going for this coaching job, man. And, and something in me compelled me to apologize. And I was like, I'm sorry. I couldn't get it done. It's not even on me. Like I wasn't the top five recruit. I wasn't, I came out of nowhere. Like, and, and I apologized to him because I was like, it's, it's weighing heavy on my heart. And he said, um, and his response was, he said, you, you did everything you could for me. I love you. And I appreciate you for that. Right. And it was like the chapter was closed after that. And that was my moment. And, um, and, I, and I'll end this segment by asking you, and I think I know the answer with all the things that happen in a way that, you know, we, it's a lot of stuff on this podcast. We just can't talk about. Right. It's just like, it was great. It's good times. You know what I mean? But the language and what we would have to say to get the story to be funny, we couldn't do, but right. would you do it all over again? If you Absolutely. had the opportunity. Absolutely. Good. Not AJ, it wouldn't even be a decision. Uh, I remember my dad, my, I'm sitting there in that lunchroom cafeteria, you know, the, those old high school, cafeterias and you know you're already dealing because my dad's a coach so you're always you're already dealing with that dynamic with your peers and I'm sitting in that cafeteria and dad comes in to interrupt me I'm sitting with all my fellas and he comes in and say hey can I talk to you and I'm like come on why you bother me I'm in, I'm in the lunchroom with my guys you know and I'm I actually probably was a little disrespectful to my dad let alone right. my high school coach um and he says all right he just goes like this. He goes, 
all right, well, just Coach Knight was on the phone. Man, I jumped out of that seat, and I'm like, sorry, fellas, I got to go. Yo. And I go out in the hall, and he said, he said, well, I didn't know I was bothering you. And so, Dad, Dad, just tell me, what's going on? He said, well, Coach Knight just called, and he offered you a scholarship. What do you want me to tell you? I said, call him back and tell him yes. <laughs> You're right. <It's> no question. <laughs> I mean, and that was, that was my recruitment. And if that would be today, it'd be the same kind of recruitment. Absolutely. Well, I want to personally thank you for your time, man. I appreciate you, it. It's just been a lot of fun. Lot. You gave me an hour, man, and, and I'm forever grateful for it. You are truly one of the four, five best players, four best players to ever wear that jersey. And I, I, I hope these people give you your flowers while you're still here. And it's okay for you to accept that. You are you are the measuring stick. I hope it was your nation enjoyed this trip down memory lane. I want you guys to continue to support Coach Offer. And I did have um, – one thing I wanted to mention or talk about before all of that is, was there any a real any of those times that you that the Indiana job was open? Were you really on a, interested in getting that job, or is this all media hoopla? Because I know I was praying. I'm like, please, I want to see a former player on those sidelines at some point. Archie has done an fabulous job. Tom Crean has done, did a great job when he was here. Kelvin Sampson, Mike Davis, but it's something about, you know, having that, the guy that that went through those wars that you went through, man in that sideline, understanding what the culture needs to be like. And there's an adjustment period when someone's new. I think Archie will get there. But um, is there any real, realism to that, you know, those rumors that you one day was going to be a coach at IU? Yeah, I think when, when the job's obviously opened and there's, I think, been three or four different times that's yeah. opened. Um, those things surfaced and, you know, obviously it's home. It, it's, it's where I grew up. I, I, I've spent all my life other than post-college, you know, now I've moved West, but yeah. post-college prior to that, it was all Indiana. I've, yep. I've had, <laughs> right. I, I now have the longest withstanding uh, private camp in the state of Indiana. We've, we've had that since 1986. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, so I've got incredible ties back there and, have developed incredible relationships along the year. So, you know, say that, did I have interest? Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I can't tell you that I never had interest when they opened sure. because it's Indiana and that's home, but uh, no, I never got a call, you know, oh. I, it, it's opened up four times and I've never been called by Indiana. So that's it's, and, and there's, but there's no hard feelings. Uh, sure. I, I am in truly blessed every spot I've been, including uh -huh. the job I got at UCLA when I got fired, I, every yeah. spot has been, so special and so blessed with the players I got to coach, the staffs that I've got to work on, the career that I've had. I, I've been incredibly blessed. I'm in a really cool spot here in Reno. I'm 25 minutes from Tahoe. I, I got a bad day. I go right over. There you the go there. right there. I got <laughs> one of the most beautiful lakes there is in the world. And so it, it there are beautiful people here. It, I've, I've been very, very blessed. So there's no hard feelings at all. And you mentioned early in the podcast, I, I, those are the school, the scores I look at, mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm three hour difference. So I get to watch a lot of the games now live. I follow Archie. Mm -hmm. I follow Tom. I followed Kelvin. I followed Mike, you know, so these are all guys. I, there was never a time I'm sitting back there rooting against them. Right. You know? no, uh, no, no, no. Unless they play their interest, obviously, but <laughs> right. um, I'm a, I'm a man of faith and I know it's, it's God's plan. And Absolutely. my, my plan was to play there. My plan was not – my direction was not to coach there. And right. mm -hmm. I'm at great peace because I know I'm following the right plan. Absolutely. That's, an, that's unbelievable that you never got the, got a call. But, uh, you know, I it think – wasn't that, in the plan. Yeah, I'm that's crazy. Perfectly fine with it. It's, that's great. Are we, no, no, we'll, hard, no hard feelings here. We'll have hard feelings for you. Don't even <laughs> – <worry. laughs> that's I, fine. I, that's I gave, fine. I'm calling you. You wanted the first calls I'm making, and if I'm an yeah. athletic director at that time. But, well, I appreciate so Archie, it. like you said, Archie's doing a good job. I think he – Everybody's, uh, yep. Some of the same traits that we were that had coming up with Coach Knight. I think he's more similar to Coach Knight than any other coach before when it comes to his principles defensively, his approach to the game and the seriousness mm -hmm. of the game. And I get a chance to interview him next week. So, uh, but Good. it's not like, you know, being able to get you a call and say, hey, Steve, I'm coming up. See your practice, man. Let's I appreciate play, it. Let's well, play we get, some horse. <laughs> we, get through COVID. we get through COVID. You're exactly. welcome to come anytime. We'd love I to have you get this way. Hey, have a great uh, day, man, and thank you. I Follow Coach Offer at University of Nevada. It's gonna be if we have, they're able to play, it's gonna be a special team, and and we'll stay in touch, man. Thank you, Steve. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it, AJ. Thanks a lot for having me on.